So again, welcome to another Scro Nova Scribes. I'm really excited to introduce Travis Dobler. We met each other on LinkedIn. Um, and Travis, among other amazing things, is a presentation coach. And um, as you all know, as facilitators, as graphic facilitators, as consultants, personal presence counts a lot. That is one of those things that I, I, I think you can learn it, but boy, is it hard. And I think the difference between a good facilitator and a great facilitator is all about presence, their understanding, their ability to read the energy that's in the room and the way that they actually project energy out. So uh, Travis actually gave some coaching to me and to Rachel, and I got such good advice from him on how I present myself, my body language, facial expressions, cutting out filler words, other things about how I present that I wanted to introduce him to this group and do a Nova Scribes. So Travis, welcome. Um, anything that you would add about your background, your bio before we jump into it? Sure. Um, thanks for having me. I'm super stoked. I love that this is a group of people who just want to improve. Like we're talking about with Nancy's attitude, like everybody being excited to learn. So um, super already juiced up just to like be around people who care about learning. Um, yeah, you've, you've summarized well kind of how we met and what we did initially. I have a lot of different hats that I'm wearing right now. I think a lot of coaches and people who do workshops tend to do that. Uh, I W2 at a tech company. I work to train their salespeople. I'm co-actively coaching with their leaders, opportunity by opportunity, supporting mostly the West region and our strategic acquisition or new logo teams. When I'm not coaching that team or helping them on board, I am doing anything that you could need an enablement consultant for. How should I pay my people? What should our training program look like? What methodology and framework should we use here? A few years ago, I got the opportunity to be a certified speaking coach uh, through a company that is called Red Cup Learning. They do a uh, special presentation excellence um, uh, presentation, a, a train the trainer that was like the last part of onboarding at a company I worked at called Citrix. So I learned that I got TTT certified and I just love doing this type of coaching because you get to see that tangible result. All of us probably love to make things or see the things that we've changed and it can be hard in this virtual world and with things that are professional skills. And this is something where if you come through a three-day workshop, I record you in day one and then I record you on day three and you can just see the difference. So it's, it's a really fun process. It's something that not everybody has time for or doesn't make the biggest difference for everybody. But if you're ready to sharpen that saw, uh, it's such a valuable skill. So I've been doing speaking coaching. Most recently, I coached the main presenter at Adobe Max. Um, that's their big event where they talk about all their new technology and things like that. And uh, it's a buddy of mine from college and they wanted him to just talk about his ethos and he had a good framework of what he wanted to talk about, but we polished it up a lot. So that is about me. I'm Seattle based. I grew up in Florida. I was born on the Eastern shore of Virginia. My whole family's from New York. So I probably got like everybody somewhere in there that has family or friends there. Um, and just as way of introduction, since that was one of my slides I'd shown you, Brian, maybe this yeah. would be fun to warm up with uh, here quickly. So I imagine a lot of us know how to annotate. If you don't, it's usually that pencil icon or at the top of your screen, you'll see a view options and then you can click annotate. And if you want to choose a stamp like a star or if you just want to circle and draw on my map, let me know where you're calling in from today. Okay, we got Nancy in Tennessee, Heather in Colorado, Gina. Gina, I know you responded to my survey and you're excited to learn about how we structure things. Looks like a couple neighbors are over there in Arlington across the pond from DC. Uh, where Where is Tennessee at? What, what city? Because you kind of went in between uh, Nashville. Memphis and Nashville. Is that Nashville? Knoxville? Nashville. Oh, oh, heavens no. No, I teach at Vanderbilt. <laughs> okay, awesome. I'm in Nashville. <laughs> gotcha. Very cool. I, I spent a lot of my first field sales job around the East Coast, the whole Eastern Seaboard. So the Carolinas, I see we got here too. Um, I was in the Tech Triangle a lot, the Virginia area, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, a lot of places. Okay, awesome. Thanks for that. And I always throw a couple stars in here. I don't want to offend anybody by leaving them out, which I guess I left Canada out of these stars. So they're usually nice people. Um, thanks for that, everybody. Just to give you a little bit more background real quick, I guess. And uh, 
tell you a few more things and then Brian, uh, we can kind of go back and forth and see what, what you want to talk about, what would be helpful. Um, the basic, so, so I, like I said, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I love that there's a good foundation attached to this, not just that we all enjoy this, but that there's like a cause here. Um, I think that's really cool. Something that I have done in my personal work to support causes is offer mentoring, career advice, interview coaching, and feedback. A, a lot of it's similar to what we'll talk about today. Um, one thing I've made is a free resource. So if you ever uh, want to visit learning.iscool, we could throw that in the chat, learning is cool. Um, you'll see that there's a resource tab. And under my resources, I plan to make more of these, but the first one I made is this toolkit. And it's essentially a way to keep calm when you're prepping for a presentation. It's full of helpful reminders. Uh, people who are very good at presenting told me it reminded them of things they've learned. People who get very nervous before presenting have told me that it's done a ton for them. Oops, and I see some annotations still popping up. Um, but yeah, feel free to check out learning that is cool. Um, if you haven't been on a website like that, if nobody's ever been on a dot cool, I didn't know they existed about a year ago. There are dot cools, dot ninja, there's dot io now, dot media, whatever your specialty is, if you get a website, it might be a cool thing to have. Uh, it also might mean that people accidentally type in dot com when they're looking for your services. Since a lot of what I focus on is small behavior change. I liked the idea that it was making you pay attention to that detail and change from .com to a .cool. So um, that's a little bit about why I chose to go with learning is cool. I also think that it needs that type of revamp. I'm somebody who gets hired a lot for my energy and relatability with audiences and sales teams that are at the lower level. So that means that we need to invigorate them and show them that learning is cool. And it stems across more than just what happens in the classroom or with sales. Um, I think everybody's gotten to know me a little bit so we can skip that. I wanted to hear from the crowd. What are you all afraid of? I want to just start off like, what are your, what are big fears that you have out there? Election results. <laughs> Election results. Yeah. Uh, in, impending world war doom, I would add as, as one in there for sure. For me, it's spiders. I don't know. What else is anybody afraid of? Rachel's off mute. Oh, I was going to say collapse. Like collapse of the economy or a building? Um, Collapse. I started a podcast today about what collapse is and means. And I'm like, well, this is interesting, but also a little scary. So it's just like okay. collapse of society, kind of. <laughs> okay, so collapse of society. I don't know. Some I, some people might be afraid of being in big buildings without a big building around them might collapse. What other fears? Anybody else have one? I see Gina's got like a, a ocean background and a beautiful message, by the way, that it's okay to pause. Always. Is anybody, Thank you. Are, you. Is anybody afraid of like open water? Anybody afraid of sharks or being in like big open water? Good. That's a common one for I'm I'm a surfer. You can see my surfboard up there. So not one for me. Cool. Um, Maybe we're afraid of not having rest or not being able to take breaks. So I'm going to take that one too from your background. Tate says small spaces. I don't know why these keep going away. Is an eraser or something? Small spaces, things that are sticky. That's a fun one. Oh, that's Heather. <laughs> <laughs> you knew right away. I don't know if there's a story to that one or what there. Um, okay, so claustrophobia. I get that one a lot too. All right, excellent. Thanks for that, everybody. So I, I like to think about that to put them in context, all these things that we could be afraid of before I usually share a clip of uh, Jerry Seinfeld, and maybe you've seen this, maybe you haven't. Oh, I saw a thing, actually, a study that said, speaking in front of a crowd. Are you able to hear him? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, I didn't check that box of share sound, so. Consider the number one fear of the average person. I found that amazing. Number two was death. <laughs> Death is number two? This means to the average person, if you have to be at a funeral, you would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. <laughs> uh, so I love that. I think it's hilarious. I think it's relatable. I saw a couple of you laugh at it as well. And maybe we felt that way 
as good as I feel about presenting today, I was not always that way. And in sales, it's nerve wracking. Sales can be made up of a bunch of gray space and unknowns. And I would get up there for a quarterly business review and know a bunch of things that I don't know and feel unconfident at, and I would stumble through it. Um, so maybe last way to survey the crowd here. Go ahead. If you want to annotate on my screen, tell me where you're at. Um, if as it relates to presentation skills or public speaking, do you love to do stuff like that? Or do you hate it and sometimes just have to do it? Brian leans toward love. Heather and Kate and Gina all toward love. Awesome. Okay. So a lot of us are dealing in this realm. That's great. That means we don't have to talk too much today about conquering your fears. Maybe you like to do it and you want to just get better at it is what that means. Awesome. Um, well, thank you everybody for Please, telling me. Just offer, if, if anybody wasn't able to use the annotate, um, just you know, call it out and I'll stamp it for you. So maybe Karen, Paul, anybody else? Where do you stand on this line? Okay, my Karen, chat. if you're speaking right now, I can't hear you. So where's the annotate? I don't see it. <laughs> it's at the top of the screen. Oh, okay. Right under view options. There, view options. that's where just where it was last time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they move it around, I swear. It's different meeting to No, meet. it was there, but... Um, <clears throat> So I like it, but I, my fear is forgetting my train of thought. That's what my fear is. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll put myself here. Forgetting train of thought. Nice. Okay. And I saw somebody else had just gone right there as well. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. That's totally common to forget our train of thought and it feels so important and we practice so much. It's a terrible feeling when you start getting partway into recognizing that. Nice. Okay. Anybody else want to shout out where you're at? I think we got most of them now. Admire and love it. Ooh. Okay. And that's from Paul. Okay. Thank you, Paul. So you admire and you love it, but you'd like to get better at it. That's where I started too. I love to connect with people. I love to be in the middle of people. There's such a great feeling when you've got an idea in your head and you can get a room full of people to understand that idea or support it in a business context and a personal context. Um, it, it's totally a lot of fun in my toolkit. Um, you'll see that I, I list a couple of those reasons as well. It's a great feeling to be confident and have others benefit from your ideas. Um, a lot of jobs, a lot of meaningful work rely on being able to do that. And, um, if you've ever been bored, then you probably want to change things up. Um, if, if you're somebody who's been in the audience and somebody's lost you, you understand what that feeling is like. You don't want to create that for other people. I don't want people to sit there bored and miserable. and like, why did I sign up for this session with Travis? So, um, and Gene, I saw your, your note in there as well. The preparation it takes and, and how hard that can be is a big part. And I, I know you're interested in the format stuff. So um, that's totally a, a, a big part of it as to the why we want to feel confident, how it loses so much impact of your message. I'm somebody that this training is messed up. I just count filler words. When I watch TED Talks, when somebody gives a good presentation, I'm just, I sit there with um, like, and at the top of my notes, and I'm just putting tallies every time I hear one of them. It's totally messed me up. Uh, Gina, you were laughing with me there. Do you do that too? I don't. I have very mixed feelings about filler. Sometimes I actually think it serves an important uh, placeholder place, but not always in the realm of standing in front of the crowd and trying to tell a story. Totally. I don't want anybody to communicate like a robot or inhumanly. Sometimes we use words that seem like fillers because we're holding that space for a second, or it's a sensible transition. It might not be the best one or creative, but it works. So I, I hear you on that. I'm also about communicating as a human. Sometimes to be effective, we're not always clear with that either. Nice. Thanks for sharing that. Um, if you do download the deck, everybody, you'll see there's six different sections with activities in them. Brian and I are going to kind of go back and forth today and talk about different things. If something comes up that's good out of one of these sections, we'll do the activity out of it and talk about it a little bit. Um, so that's that's really all I've got to warm us up. Of course, uh, I see a lot of cameras on. That's always helpful for all of our conversations. I always get a lot out of that. Um, I, I can see your reactions. I can see if you're starting to like fall asleep or if you laugh at something with me. 
I want to keep the discussions up and collaborating with each other. And we've already nailed down how to use our annotate tools. So um, with all that, I'll, I'll kick us off with a funny quote. And Brian, you can take it from here on what you think the audience would like to talk about. Um, always a fun quote I, I ask is, why does the audience know when a presentation's over? But for some reason, the presenter up there boring us to death doesn't. <laughs> I love that. Thanks, Travis. So uh, when when Travis worked with with Rachel and I, I, I had to I had to educate him a little bit on the difference between a presenter and a facilitator. Um, I think that it's I would have put myself a little bit further towards the left side of that chart when it comes to if I could call it straight presentation. You know, that is just running slides and talking forever long. I have to. Um, and so I went I went through his deck and I, I wanted to touch on the things that I thought were particularly relevant for facilitators because we don't necessarily do presentation the way that a keynote uh, address might do that. We have to engage, we have to be on stage, we have to be present, but it's a conversation for us. It's a dialogue. Uh, it's, it's a, there's a back and forth that's there. And so Travis, I wanted to start with the, the mind and body section. Um, in that one, you talk about, for example, tone of voice, facial expression, body language, the way that you use your hands. What what are some of the uh, the tips and tricks, and and most importantly, what would you say are some of the the pitfalls that people run into when it comes to the way that they express themselves audibly and visibly? Ooh, really good question to start out, and perhaps one of my favorite parts of presenting. Well, this is something that I didn't realize makes such a difference. And, and yes, hand gestures and how you stand, we'll talk about uh, entirely. Um, but for me, the mind and body that started to really enhance my presentations, get rid of my jitters, help me feel organized and prepared, uh, came to physical exercise. Um, I'm like a lot of us, we're so busy. We're constantly in a day with information, we're hunched over our desk. My back hurts when I cook now because I'm over my desk or all in these weird positions. And taking care of your body really does so much. So a, a big tip I always share is that on the day of presenting, you should exercise rigorously for 20 minutes. If you're a lackadaisical weightlifting type of worker outer, that's okay too. Do that for like an hour probably. But there's a lot of science that shows how the body, um, when it gets fresh blood flowing to the brain and clears out kind of its own cash, that that helps you think better. It helps oxygen be more readily available. Your thoughts will feel more organized. There's also this aspect of working out around repetition and doing things that are hard. Uh, a book I read in the last year is called uh, Eat That Frog. Eat the frog, do the hard thing first, right? And so if I've worked out this morning, if I've done reps and I'm tired from those reps, well, I know that when I was tired on the eighth rep, I was still able to do a ninth. When I was tired on the ninth rep, I was still able to do a tenth. There's something about that continuous improvement. And I know it was hard to wake up and work out this morning, but I already did that that just boosts our confidence by so much. So that's a huge tip for me is, is how we work out beforehand, how we stretch and really come into the body, feel what the body means and connect it with your mind so you can operate everything well. If anybody's ever given like a presentation while you're hungover or given a presentation um, when, yeah, a couple of laughs, or uh, given a presentation when you don't feel good, you're just like sick, you understand how the body totally messes with the brain and fogs it and how it can make you feel not confident. So um, that's a really big tip for me. In terms of pitfalls I see, outside of people that don't work out or something like that, I see a lot of times people stand in um, what I'll call the, the fig leaf pose. <laughs> <laughs> Laura knows that one. Um, the fig leaf pose, here, here it is in my deck. Um, you can see this, this fellow right here, right? That's, that's who we're really talking about is uh, standing with your arms kind of in front of you and you're just like looking at your colleague or something like that. I don't, I don't know, Laura, you laugh. Like, how does that pose make you feel when you see somebody that way? Um, I, I, there, there are three that I really am struck by. One's the fig leaf. The other is the friar tuck. People get very, very religious when they're about to give a presentation and they're doing it. And so you see this prayerful thing going on. Like, oh, I thought you were going to say they like kind of like move their belt a lot, you know, like well, the, the it could be. <laughs> and then there's the Alfred Hitchcock where the person puts their hands behind their back. Mm. Laura, you got it. You got to demonstrate the Friar Tuck. I'm not picturing oh, it. Oh, the Friar Tuck? Yeah. Um, wait a minute. I got to back up here. 
I've got this thing going. Uh, I've seen this. I do a lot of presentation skills training. And, and so I've got a lot of this. And I always say people are, are never as religious as they can, um, usually are until they get before an audience. And they're, they're like suddenly seeking divine guidance. Right. Or they're all of a sudden the most patient person in the world. Like you said, the hands, the old hands behind the back, sometimes like yeah. a rock back and forth. Yep. Right? yep. So these are all good pitfalls. Thanks for adding those in. And please, like if you have, if anybody else's presentation skills or funny stories to share, I'd, I'd love to keep them going. Um, that's, that's totally common ones. And it's hard to keep our feet still. It's hard to stay in the moment, even in our chairs. I, I find I want to rock and readjust and get comfortable. And the root of that is coming from my nervousness. The root of that is coming from not knowing where I'm going to go next. If my mind doesn't know what my words are going to do next, the mind can get anxious about what the rest of the body is going to do as well. So I, I see this happen a lot where people will rock back and forth and it's really distracting. And even if you're not nervous, it makes you look nervous. The hand stuck. You can see I've got Steve Jobs through the years here. And look, he did he did the uh, the fryer tuck, the, the hands. It's not to say that you can't use all of these or can't use them at the right point in time. The big idea is that we should vary them. So I remember, for instance, when I was coaching with um, Brian, that uh, I don't think that you had done this, um, Brian. I think that Rachel might have used hand gestures because I told you about hand gestures. And so Rachel in her presentation was using more hand gestures. And a really common one is this, right? We just have our arms open. We're just explaining stuff. It shows we're welcoming feedback or that we're considering things, we're weighing options. Super normal and a good one to use, but I want everybody to think about what are extra ones that you can do. So a, a lot of them to me that come naturally, or you can start to count things on your hands and be mindful of if they're in frame or not. Or if you have a large audience, not virtual, you might count way up here. One, this, two, this, to show that everybody's welcome to participate in that. But here virtual, I wanna be right here in front of you. Make sure you know the, the three tips, right? Um, so counting is one that I think is really easy for people to start to incorporate more hand gestures. You might be talking to somebody about them versus what you typically do. I find that people don't like to be pointed at, but an open hand to suggest your processes with a head tilt is a little bit welcoming versus what I might do and to refer to myself. Um, I've been playing a lot with pushing and pulling uh, recently. I have a coworker who does it so naturally and it makes him look so animated. And so when we're talking about like, you gotta really lean on that person. You gotta make them feel that they gotta answer you, you know, cause otherwise they're not coming back to us. So I've been working a lot with pushing and pulling recently, but um, yeah, that's, that's a couple of the um, common pitfalls I see. If you do struggle with virtual presenting, um, something else that I always recommend is to keep some googly eyes up by your camera. If you put these maybe smaller ones than this, but if you put little small ones next to your camera, it'll feel like you're talking with a human. So you'll be reminded to look up at this screen a little bit more and talk directly to you. Like this type of engagement probably feels a lot better than in, you know, a Google meet when I'm down here looking at myself the whole time or whatever. So the googly eyes is like always a, a fun tip or trick for me to bring up as well. It's a fantastic one, Travis. I, I have a, a little Mecha Godzilla because I kind of like, you know, robots and kaiju and you know of course you combine those two you get mecha godzilla so he he rests right on top of my camera just as a reminder look at the camera there right yeah that works if you feel like you're normally working with people like that i see some in the chat uh kate has a post to note with a smiley face that's fun mm -hmm. i like that you can like doodle in one meeting and then use it as your person for the next meeting or something how about since we're on mind and body, uh, what would you say about tone of voice? Uh, is there anything to keep in mind around voice, rate of speech, pitch, tone, timbre? Totally. Here's a fun question. You can throw it in the chat or say it off mute. How many words per minute do you believe we think at? How many words per minute do we think at? 127. Very specific, Gina. 25. 220. Okay. Oh, I love this. I love when I get the low ball answers. We actually think, oh, Heather, maybe I started giving it away. Heather, Heather, you nailed it. Um, we typically see that people think between 800 and 1500 words per minute. It can go higher, but between that 800 to 1500 words per minute is how fast we're thinking. New number. 
How many words per minute, <laughs> Brian? How many words per minute? It's just the same word, same two words over and over again for him. Um, how many words per minute can a conversation be at? How many words per minute is the typical conversation? 3,200. Now everybody's like, it must be my first answer I gave. <laughs> yeah, these answers are much closer. Uh, Paul doubling down with the 1,500. Maybe because like my family is from New York that sometimes I get going in that 1,500 mile per hour pace. But typically a conversation between two people is about two words a second. So 125 words per minute. So you have 1,000 words in your mind you want to use this minute but you can only use about 60 to 100 of them. It makes sense that when we don't practice well or a new thought comes to mind in a presentation because we didn't practice with it, that we start to get the uh, ums, ahs, things like that start to naturally creep out because they're filling in the gap between those thousands of words you're trying to grab. Mm. So something that I, I always tell everybody and uh, exactly, that's why we need to graphically record. If a picture is worth a thousand words, you can capture a lot more thoughts, right? Um, and I, I feel like, you know, we know each other well, so I'm not going to keep breaking into full slide mode. I'll let you see what the build slides are and stuff like that. But I always present full mode when I'm presenting. Um, but just since we're kind of picking and choosing out of the deck. So filler words, um, a really big thing for me is how you slow down to eliminate them. So yes, practice. I practice everything. Um, I'll, I'll want to hear from you all about how you practice in a second here. But um, if we not just practice to feel confident, but if we slow down, in the moments we slow down, there's a lot of advantageous places to do that. I'll show you in a second. Um, the other thing that I recommend everybody doing, especially those of you who like to do this or who think you're pretty good at this and you're a certified coach and all that, I'm curious when the last time is you recorded yourself and watched that recording of yourself present because I know we get away from it and I know it is so helpful when we can do it. I hate the sound of my voice too. I hate how I transition. I hate watching myself put on the show sometimes. It feels really awkward. But if you watch that footage, you're going to learn so much about yourself. I'm also happy, by the way, if you email me a recording of yourself, uh, Brian knows this because I, I had him submit a, a link ahead of time before we did presentation coaching and anybody I do present coaching with. If you have a link to a recording you've done or you're doing one in the next couple of weeks, I'm happy to look at it and give you some coaching just uh, right off the bat through email about things I notice you do well, um, things that you could improve upon. So. I find that watching yourself is a great way to eliminate your filler words and find the places to pause, the places to put good transitions. A lot of our filler words come because we just did so well with this topic. I just crushed this. We just had good dialogue back and forth. And now I need to recenter us into the next subject. And I give a big, so moving on to this, or I might do, uh, something where I'll say, and let me pull my slides back up. Let's jump into it. Let's get right back to it. Ooh, weak language that we can probably improve upon. Uh, maybe another good place to annotate here. <laughs> um, if you all want to annotate, tell me what, what are filler words of yours? What do you do a lot? And I'll be honest, I, I'm not perfect. I'll, I'll mark a couple for myself. Yeah, I'm a kind of guy. Uh, um, yeah, the just, just kind of. <laughs> Gina, so, and Gina, I know you said you want to get structure out of this and we're going to talk more about it. Structure can help us so much with the transitions and avoiding that. So Nancy's okay. Actually, I love that one. Actually, okay. Good to see these. Yeah, the like one got underlined too. Um, I, I know that's a fun one that we had, uh, Rachel, last time we had spoken that, that you were working on was the likes and you called it out yourself. You're like, I know I do this one. Really good. So I, I kind of put these into different categories. And in fact, something funny, uh, when we were doing our presentation coaching, I brought up how when I would first be certified, there was a button, kind of like an easy button in the room. That was easy. But instead of that was easy, it was a big, loud, annoying buzz. <clears throat> Every time I'd use one of these, <clears throat> it was so frustrating. I was driven to the point of 
pre-tears. I won't say they were tears, but pre-tears. Um, because I was so frustrated with myself and I couldn't remember that thing and I'd practiced and thought I was so good at this my whole life. It really threw me off. Something that Brian did that was fun is uh, he would throw a note card up about whatever your filler was as somebody would say it. And actually, I need to pick Brian's brain. I want to develop cards for this that on the back will have little hints to get rid of it. So Okay, let me just say that was within the context of presentation coaching. I wasn't just doing that to everybody, okay? Yes, 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 yes. Of course, it, we were doing it for that reason. It wasn't a business meeting. He's like, oh, heard it. Um, he was doing it to help coach. So really cool coaching tool. And I noticed that we, we say a lot of these in different ways. I can tell them with graphic designers too. Somebody put a banner around, hopefully. That's awesome. Um, but when I, when I think about these, they come from a lot of different areas. Some of these are mid-sentence fillers, uhs and ums, mid-sentence filler. I, I'm between thoughts. I know I have more to say. I just haven't thought about what the next thousand words are that I should pick from. Uhs and ums creep right out. Hopefully, sorta, actually, kinda, those are words that you use when you're not even sure of what you're talking about. Hey, I just want to kind of like talk to you guys about how maybe you're presenting today. Woo, weak language, not just fillers, but also weak. So you've got to be confident in yourself. That comes from your practice, your expertise, from your workout in the morning. Also, before some meetings, I'll, I'll do a super pose. And I tell everybody that I do interview prep for, do a pose before your meeting, like your Superman or like puff your chest out and be confident because it makes the body follow that form. We are creatures of stimulus and response. So when's the last time I did this when I was celebrating something? Some of the neurons in the mind start to connect and help me feel confident. So that might eliminate some of your kind of sort of hopefullys. Things like write. That one is because you don't, you don't believe in your audience engagement. If you're sitting there having asked, right guys, right? Everybody believe in that? That's like a cheap check-in question. So a little bit of fun here. Thanks for sharing that with me. I, uh, I'm actually going to screenshot this. I love that feedback. And Travis, while you're doing that, there's a really great question from Karen in chat. What tip do you offer for forgetting where you were? I'm thinking about more for a spontaneous response to a question. For for instance, you didn't get a great sleep and you feel a little off your game. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, this one's really tough to do in the moment. That's an awesome question. I sometimes forget where I'm at. Happens all the time because we field questions from so many different uh, viewpoints, from different levels, different types of thinkers who might be just questioning you the whole time. So we will forget where we're at mid-sentence or you know that you went down a tangent, you gotta get out of that tangent. Couple things. First one you're gonna hate me for is just to prep more, prep better. Um, I'm, I'm curious if everybody wants to throw in the chat, how many hours, if you're gonna talk for one hour or facilitate for an hour, present for an hour, how long do you spend preparing for that? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Either three to six. I think, I think Heather, that's, um, yeah, percent, it, it depends what you're doing. Five, three. Okay, the three to six area is what I hear most common. This like four to six area is what a lot of professionals say to do. Um, that amount of hours means that you'll know your content better. And if it's that you got interrupted on the way to something you were transitioning to, you'll better anticipate what was expected. So preparing, but I know that answer sucks. So let me give you a couple other answers, okay? Um, another answer is that I'm a huge writer. I write all the time. Um, I, I like to use OneNote for meetings and keep track of stuff. There's all these AI assistants and everything like that. I like to write. And when I write, I have my own method and I'm sure that some of you have your own method because you have a lot of tools and facilitation, um, tool, visual tools. What I do with my stuff is as I'm hearing a question and I think of what the answer should be, which we often can do, I'll write the answer down ahead of time. I'll let them finish the question, clarify a little bit. And then I know I have the key answer I wanted to get through, through all that clarification. So that's one thing. If I'm on my way to somewhere, I've talked about points one and two, and you got me after that. And I know oh, I got to get the three. I'll write down the third point too, really quick so that I remember where I was headed after this question. That gives me peace of mind that it's right here. That's something I do live on stage in front of 500 people. I'll have paper with me or I'll have a clipboard with me or a podium where I can write things down. Um, so I, I, I definitely write down a lot will help me. I also use different indicators for what I wrote down means. 
So for instance, when I set my pen down, I point to the thing on the paper that I want to answer with or what's next so that I know it's coming up. If something's an action item and requires follow-up, I didn't know the answer. You ever look back at your notes, you're like, what the hell was I doing? Uh, I circle those. Anything that requires action, I put a circle around. So cheap tricks. Uh, I'm sure if I'm in a room with so many good visual facilitators, you have your own ways to keep track of, of notes and where you're going. But um, those are some things that help me get back on pace or remember where I was going. The hardest part, for those of you ready for this advanced move, is to eliminate uh, the self-talk. So self-talk is, I'm opening my PowerPoint. Oh, where's my Zoom tool? I can't find, there it is. It's always hiding from me. And now I'm launching the chat. Just be quiet. Just, just uh, to be quiet when you're in those stages of trying to pull in or remember the next thought. Don't, don't say, hmm, let me try to remember my next thought. Or you made me forget where I was going. Try to eliminate that stuff and just pull a slide back up. Even if you're super off topic and you just start talking about something new, it feels a lot more like you're a professional, you're trustworthy, and like you must have just handled that question. There's nothing else to talk about. We're moving on to the next subject yeah. without losing me. Travis, let me, I want to double down on what you just said, because I think it's especially important for facilitators, which again, we have a slightly different job. Um, I, I just worked, worked with a phenomenal facilitator today. Uh, and here's what she did that I think could have been tweaked a little bit. She would give a prompt. She'd ask a question of the group and invariably there were some crickets and she felt obligated to fill that space. Mm. So what that did is that took people off the hook to give an answer. And so I think as facilitators, we have to use silence and we have to use a productive pause. If your prompt was clear and if the knowledge was in the room, don't feel obligated to, to fill the space. Let them twitch a little bit. And I think if you identify as a little bit more on the introverted side, this is where your superpower really shows up. You can wait them out. The extroverts <laughs> will get uncomfortable a lot more quickly than you will. So again, if you've got a clear prompt, and the knowledge is in the room, just let silence stand. Absolutely. And to challenge you all, if you record yourself. Laura's got a comment on this one. Intentionally stop for a second or two so you can watch how natural one to two seconds sounds as a pause. It sounds so much louder in her head. But record yourself talking. Pause. What did you want to ask, Laura? Yeah, I saw you like thinking. Um, one of the things, if you are on the spot and you are answering a question and you lose your train of thought one of the things i find i never go anywhere without a bottle of water because nobody ever looks at the presenter and said my god she drank like a fish it was the most disgusting thing they don't do that and so you pause you take a sip of water and then you you are now your self-talk is i've got this where was i going and you put the water bottle down and then you're ready to go on so you're talking Absolutely. yourself through your mem uh, your momentary lapse of memory. And it's natural and it's normal. And back to what Brian said, that, that pause is really fine because people in your audience, they're chewing on what you've already said. So give them time to enjoy it. Give them time to really bat it around in their head. Absolutely. That non-verbally gives them a cue that they could take a sip of water really quick. That we're just digesting things here. This is good to let it hang. Nice tip. I like that a lot. Um, another thing I, I want to give you, because I know the question was about in the moment when it happens, just like when we lose anything else, retrace your steps. There's a chance you went down this rabbit hole because it was a question or it's something that interrupted based off a point you shared. So even if you already shared point two, just, just go back to your steps and be like, as we were saying, point two, and then maybe you've already said it and you'll realize that because the words feel familiar or the motion of thinking about it feels familiar and you can skip through it. That's what I would say. I've, I've got some good areas to uh, share with you where I like to pause and give pause. And so maybe this will give you a couple ideas for places where you can. Maybe you have other ones to add. I'd, I'd love to add some, but these are natural. After you greet your audience, a lot of us want to roll right into the introductions and get to the meat of the content, the, the stuff I'm nervous about being here to present today. Greet, greet your audience genuinely. Be present with them. How's it going today? I know you came from this. Hands up if you liked that. Throw a one through five on how you're feeling today. Really pause and greet them and spend time with them to establish uh, your relationship. And we could talk a lot about that, I'm sure. 
at the end of a provocative statement. So uh, I say something as a big number. 98% of buyers don't believe a word you say. Let it hang because a lot of people are expecting me to start talking about how that applies to them instead of digesting the statement. Easy place. Of course, at the end of a sentence, uh, Brian, what you said is really familiar to me where somebody will start asking a question and in the virtual world, by the time I've heard it, it takes a second to go up to the satellite and come back. When we uh, end a sentence, when we ask for that question, what I find is better than pausing for way too long or to start to give hints, you might want to answer this way, is to clarify and ask another question that's like stupid and wrong. So, hey, anybody ever ask questions? No, asking questions is pointless. Like we don't need to do that. And they'll be like, no, of course we want to ask questions. And you get them over the hump of at least saying something, arguing with you. So um, end a sentence, you, you reminded me there. As you transition to something else, don't talk through, let me pull it up and all that stuff. Just take that pause and let the words simmer down. When you're changing slides in between, that's your transition statements as well. Virtually, after you've asked for that chat response, like Brian's talking about, after I've asked for a response, if people are typing it out, it can take a while to type a sentence. Some people might be joining mobily or T9ing you or something, right? It could take a little while. So definitely pause after you've asked for that or ask for annotation. If you ask for somebody to come off mute or you've unmuted them, when I've asked a question and they didn't hear it, or I don't have faith they did, I'll sometimes do something like, uh, yeah, and, and so Laura, in a moment, I'm gonna ask you this and let her know it's coming her way and say the question again. Um, after I've asked that question, I'll pause. And anytime you say something human, uh, this was really big in that Adobe Max one I just coached. I've got somebody up there talking about how they've experienced racism in their life, times when they've been made to cry. And they were nervous and wanted to skip right through that stuff. And I was like, dude, that's your power. Double down and hold on to that. Tell them, I just cried, man. And let that sink in for a couple seconds. It's way more impactful. So that could also be anything human about like kids and happy stuff too. Um, but a couple places there to pause that, that might help you make sense of those words and let them boil down. Thanks for that, Travis. So how about we open it up to Q&A and Heather actually kicked this off. Uh, do you have any openers that grab attention or that build trust quickly? Mm, okay. Really good question. I'm going to answer it in a couple ways. Don't get mad. Um, first, something that I like to think about is the triangle offense. I'm not a big sports person, okay? So I'm not going to get too uh, basketball heady about this. But the idea is that somebody is always open and it's super strong. A triangle is one of the strongest things that's found in nature. Three points, right? It's all about connecting your audience with you with the topic. So in terms of an opener, and this is for large openings, this is also for section by section opening, which is something often overlooked. What can you connect your audience, you and the topic with? So, you know, for this one, for instance, we all are facilitators. We all like to learn. It was really easy when I was setting up a why would we care about this? Because it's things I think I want to feel confident. It's a part of my job and it can help to make that learning even better and my stuff stick. So it's really easy to create the why. Um, that's what I would encourage everybody to start with is to think what, what's the why. If you were sitting here as one of those people who, who's a why not, like I should not be in here, I'm a negative Nancy, I'm a wet blanket, right? That type, think from that standpoint, why do they get value out of what you're talking about? So before this, you all have been lovely. I imagined you as my toughest critics who were just experts and like hated everything I had to say. And that helped me really think of why you would want to attend this. What is it that I uniquely can offer you to, to talk about? Um, there's a formatting tool in my deck if, if it helps you to think through this way um, for structure in terms of why, what, how, what if. We can talk a little bit more about that, um, but I want to answer this question thinking about openers. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a little bit closer to storytelling. Of course, I put it all the way to the bottom because I didn't think we talked about it at all today. Um, so one, these are elements you can use to be convincing in ways that you can tell stories. Here's what I put in my toolkit as ways that we can captivate people when we open. If you don't always think of these, you probably recognize them or as you see them, you're thinking of ones you've seen in the past. A personal experience, a story I can share that again is relatable with my audience. 
if I start telling everybody about my pet bearded dragon and it's like nerdy pet bearded dragon things, not about pets or food or something like that, then it's going to escape them, right? So your personal experiences, these are all within the triangle. Um, a provocative statement, like, you know, a statistic could work or something you think is not conventionally said, but you're about to back it up with your claims. Facts, videos, challenge them on something that's just been said as you're taking over or challenge the whole meaning of why you're together. Um, giving demos, using props on stage, right? I use my googly eyes. That seemed pretty captivating for everybody. Uh, quotes from others. These are just things that I want to give you as like, this is brainstorms and you can try to think of each of these. What your question's also making me think of is this is not just good for opening your general meeting, but open each section with one of these. That's level two. Level three is, can you match your close with it in each section and overall within your communication? So I might start off with a, there's an easy car buying example. 40% of buyers regret their purchases. Whoa, that's like a lot of buyers. I wonder what's going on. Let me tell you about how to make sure you're not going to regret your budget and how to get the right car. And then I end with a story about a time I regretted a purchase and how I overcame it. See how they match, even though I'm using a statistic and I'm using a story. Some people might start with a statistic and just end with a statistic. Hey, be in the 60% of people that don't regret it. That works too. But if you can pair these things to make an opening and closing, um, it's, it's really going to strengthen your presentation. So hopefully that answered that one for you. I think it, it, it answered half of it. You had another part of it, which is around building trust. So how might you do that? Oh, okay. You said captivating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so building, any of these around trust building. Yeah, I guess I did it quickly there. So I got the, the trust building. Um, trust comes from a couple places. I, I always say it comes from empathy and expertise. Empathy and expertise. Um, to build rapport with somebody and to trust somebody does not mean you have to like them. But it means that you have some things in common. Even if that's, we both work hard at different things, but I respect how you work hard and I can help you since you work hard. Uh, building rapport and building trust comes down to empathetically, I can put myself in your shoes. I know what you're going through, what your pain points are. And if not, we're gonna have a conversation for discovery so that I can learn what those things are. Other than that, uh, that empathy and you being an expert at whatever it is you say you're an expert at, um, uh, I, I quickly answered it in the triangle, the triangle offense. That's how you build trust. Look yeah. at what we have in common and how we're both mutually supposed to be here to uh, tackle this topic. So that's, okay. that's how I find trust. If you're in person, do some trust falls. I don't know, do, do anything. It's... <laughs> <laughs> why, don't we, uh, why don't we open it up to questions? And if you just wanna go ahead and go off mute or you can type something in the chat. Karen, I notice you're off mute. Maybe that's a dangling on mute. Maybe you got oh, something- Oh, it is a dangling mute, but I'll, I'll jump into it. So uh, I'm just curious, Brian, you are like right there in your frame and I'm like small and back. How do you get more? It, um, mm -hmm. more... The webcam is really, really close to me. That's how I'm doing that. Uh -huh. So I'm just really, really up on it because I like to fill the frame. You're filling it. Mm -hmm. I, I love too that Brian has his video right in the middle. So it's like easy for him to look at the screen. Um, why do you think that you take up too much or too little space? Who, me or Karen? No, no, Karen. Oh, well, you know, Brian is like so powerfully there and I'm kind of like back and small. And, uh, I just, uh, it sounds like if I just, um, you know, put my, uh, laptop a little closer, that should do it. Mm -hmm. there, there's could... one other thing, as long as we're on this, there's one other thing that I like to do that I actually learned from uh, from Heather's husband, Ray, who is a professional photographer, about the rule of thirds. And so if you divide my frame up into thirds, I try to get my eyes right on that top third line. If you could imagine a grid there, mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's a little bit more, you know, natural than this, where I'm right in the middle. Totally. Yeah, I mean, you have a much better presence when you're properly placed it comes it really impacts how you breathe and how you communicate though right you'll notice i put you on the, i'm on a standing desk i put you all to stand up with me now and it's totally changed how i feel about this conversation i work with people all the time that are doing like the looking down on it type thing and typing or there's the smiley face note um looking down on it typing or who might have um 
I've got pictures in the deck. Let me, let me pull them up. Um, what I would call the Archangel or the uh, the Noogler. If anybody knows anybody who started at Google, they give you those like twirly hat fans. Um, so sometimes we see people that are the Archangel and they have a light right behind them and it lights up a halo or lights up right behind them. And it's super distracting. Um, the twirly hat fan is one of the worst ones to me. It's those up anglers get that thing going over their head. Um, this guy's background wasn't too bad, but he's got a guitar that's just coming straight out of the top of his head. And so every time I talk to him, I'm like, ah, I just want to stop it. Um, but I coach people on this all the time. We go around in the room and we kind of just all virtually crack on each other about what's behind our backgrounds. And hopefully mine doesn't seem too bad. I normally like a slight blur. And there are different cameras you can use to get more zoomed in or less zoomed in or a different aperture so that your background slightly blurry or you give stuff away. Um, I normally have a couple ukuleles that are hanging there, but they recently fell. And I like being able to talk about my books or music or being able to talk about my surfboard and traveling. So I like to have that stuff up there. But what's important, the stat I hear is we should take up about 70% of the frame. Mm. So shoot for that uh, 70% over half of it. I love the thinking in thirds, right? Eyes at a third, your, your mouth and your jaw or that next focal point down. And then you have the bottom third for your jazz hands and your hand gestures and stuff. I would encourage you, if you feel that you're back far, use that because that means you can lean in when you're pretty interested in something. Let me know, give me some pings in your conversations or sit back when you don't like it. I can see you when your arms are crossed too is what that means. Not that this always means somebody's closed off to us, sometimes just comfortable, but you can use those to like give different pings, I would say as well. Why don't we open it up to some more questions for Travis? So if you're just joining us or if you got something to say, you can go ahead and go off mute, drop it into chat. Yeah, Jacob, what's going on? Yeah, I'm curious, Travis and others, if our notion of presence has changed maybe recently or even with pandemic of like you know the last time I was taught this I was in high school so it was very much like be strong be powerful stand in your space but now I feel like the world has changed and like we're giving power to more people and different energies and different types of folks and so in your research and readings is it like cool to be more I tend to bring like a more hippie granola vibe sometimes into spaces that are a little more corporate. Um, but curious on like societally, how have we shifted? Really good question. Um, you're gonna ask a 30 something year old man to tell you how society has shifted. Um, so I, I, I see what you're saying. I totally agree. I think that we used to communicate, everything has to be strong. And I do a lot of sales training so it's all these like dominant personality types and people that want to eliminate weak language to coerce you into a sale. Well, that was never my strong suit. That's not who I am. Um, I'm like the, the D in my disc assessment is the last letter for me. So uh, I'm similar to you. And I lean into that presence because it's something that could be balancing and helpful. What I find is we've got more of an appetite for that type of thing today. It's cool to be sensitive now. Right. It's like cool for people to have employee resource groups, career resource groups uh, to focus in that soft space that the EQ um, EQ is something really hard to come by emotional intelligence. It's really hard to come by. It's a soft skill. Like Brian said at the beginning of this, some people are good at it naturally and it's really tough to train. So the fact that you probably have a high EQ means that you can talk to different types of people. That's a strength. And I would lean into your ability to do that. When you're talking with somebody who's dominant, I would mirror what you can. C communication mirroring is a big part of communication mm -hmm. to establish trust and to have people feel heard and all that type uh, of, of things we've been talking about, but mirroring them to a level. So uh, I have a colleague who knows every time I was talking to a woman on the phone, generally speaking, because my voice would be just a like a tone higher or I would be like a little bit more comfortable. I've, I've done a bias test. If anybody's heard of the um, Harvard bias test. So one, one of my biases is toward women. Um, one of my biases is toward younger people. I talk faster, my pitch goes up a little bit because I'm excited to talk with those people. So that's something I consciously have to work on. When I meet with somebody who might be dominant and care about brass tacks, what's the value that you add? Well, I'm still fun and gonna show all of my personal benefits because their team members probably don't like that they're that way. 
and I'm the person coming in to help connect with those people. But I will mirror you in terms of what you are serious about when I come back to be serious. If I see on LinkedIn, you talk about a bunch of stats, then I'm going to mirror and give you some numbers to talk about instead of the in-between soft stuff. If I see you care about promoting your team or being cutting edge, then I'm going to mirror that type of compelling reason to, to talk with each other. Does, does that make sense? I've certainly seen the shift. I think you're right. Yeah, it reminds me of this, you know, I think authenticity is like a big buzzword I hear nowadays, although it can be hard to be authentic if you're not of the majority or you're in your audience, right? If you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to share a point, so. True, right? That's something in, I, I hear employee resource groups talk about too, that they can't always authentically show up to work themselves because maybe they use a different type of words or slang or maybe they care about something entirely different so they're constantly like in a shell trying to care about their work and i think any leader will understand the benefit of people fully out of their shells to do their best work i i have to agree with heather on this one I, if, it, if it was up to me showing up as my authentic self i don't think i'd be wearing pants um <laughs> one of the things i know that i have to do though so i i can't I've shared this. I'm I'm very introverted. My favorite thing to do is to sit there with my noise canceling headphones in a dark room with a glass of wine and just like unplugging, right? That's how I get my energy out. Nancy's giving me the thumbs up. I can't do that when I'm facilitating. If I'm like, um, okay, everyone, we're about to begin our financial review. So please stay with me for the next nine months. You're done. There's no way you can do that, right? So I just find for myself, what I have to do is I have to take my own natural energy and it's like turning it up to 11, like they say on Spinal Tap, right? I just have to find that energy and bring my authentic self up a little bit more. So it's not being inauthentic. Mm -hmm. It is for the purpose of channeling energy out to the group because I want that energy reflected back at me. As Travis was saying a, a second ago, we naturally mirror the energy that's given towards us. You know, there's a push and a pull. There's a, there's a, a Zen thing. There's a, a yin yang that happens. And so when our participants pick up on our energy, it's reflected back on us. The best way that we can get our participants to be energetic is to send that energy out uh, towards them at, in the first place. That's yeah. how energy works. It's a series of actions and reactions, like in a very physical sense. So it makes sense that we would be no different neurologically what I see in energy that I get. Um, while you've mentioned energy and introversion, extroversion, I wanna talk about that just for a second. Um, does everybody know Myers-Briggs? Little bit. personality assessment right it's an awesome one so I, I make every new team uh, that I'm a part of or any time that I'm giving somebody like my enablement coaching leave behind package it includes personality assessments like that because they're really important so if I know that Brian gets energy from being introverted right that's what introversion and extroversion mean how we get energy from people or by ourselves and I know that we've got a big conference next week or Brian and I are working to deliver a workshop next week and I'm his boss or we're just partners and it's like Thursday or Friday, I might be like, hey man, I, let's take it off. Let's take some time off. Take the afternoon off. Why don't you go recharge? Or maybe I'll send him a gift, like a book or a bottle of wine or something, because I know that he wants to spend that time with himself doing that type of activity. And that will charge him up. That will fill him up to say, to roll out of bed on Monday and say, all right, you know what? I do have the energy for today. I can, I can tackle that. I've already taken care of Brian. And that's why I also endorse the working out everybody Take some time for yourself. You've done something for yourself that day. So you feel good and able to give to others in your uh, presentations or your communications. The other big one I'll say is judge or perceiver that I care about a lot in Myers-Briggs. I, I know they all matter, but how somebody works in their work styles, if they wanna work in the mornings, if calling them out of the blue gives them anxiety, that stuff's really important to understand people's communication and work style preferences. So I always do that with new teams as well. My favorite question is, when you go on vacation, do you like to have everything planned out that you're going to do? Or do you like to just show up on the vacation and figure out what you're going to do for fun? Cool. So, so we are, it's just about 6.30. It's a little bit after 6.30. So if you have to split, no worries. Um, we're at time. I'm wondering, Travis, we haven't hit everybody quite yet. And I see a couple of folks that have some questions. Do you mind hanging around just a little bit longer? I am good for 30 more minutes. So, wow. Okay. So maybe you can, you can flex your perceiving then if you're more judging. Um, Laura, I noticed that you, uh, you came off mute. Did you have something? Um, I was just going to say in terms of the energy in the room, it's about, I think it's about the joy you bring in the room. 
the joy and the curiosity and the humility mm -hmm. because you are not there. You're, you're going to be mining. I, I do a lot of training and I'm mining group gold and I do facilitative training. And so it's I about really the joy of connecting. And I think when people understand that you are authentically just enjoying being there, learning from them, sharing some ideas, um, I think the sparks start to fly. I love that. I see Brian put it in the chat too. I wrote down mining group gold. I I I wish is that trademarked? Can I can I use that? <laughs> That's so good. Just give me credit. You got it, Laura. No, I, I love that. That's a great um, that's a great point. I was talking with somebody recently, Chad Littlefield. I don't know if anybody knows him. Um, he's an enablement presentation coach, kind of influencer guy, and he's got a, a big YouTube channel. Um, but I was talking with him. I connected with him on LinkedIn. He asked me, what's your enabler gift? And I was like, ah, what does that mean? He's like, you know, when, when you've finished a session or a workshop, what do people come up to you and say? So that's something interesting. If everybody wants to think about what your enablement gift is, my, my, or your facilitation gift, mine is totally my energy. And I used to think that that was a weakness. I was like, that means you hated all my content. Everything we just talked about and did sucked. You're only saying the nice thing you can, which is I had good energy, but the energy is a huge strength. If you can show up uh, joyful to be there and give them that energy, you will get that energy back. And I find if I can shift a room of eight people to 800 people, that means a lot to sales leaders for their mentality, their frameworks, them hiring a third party to come in here and conduct this anyway. So um, really, really cool note on, on the joy of connecting. Thanks, Laurel. Others, questions, comments, queries for Travis. Casey, you're just joining us. Welcome. Nice to see you. Glad you made it. I will check out that book. Oh, I saw Casey come off mute. I thought he had one. Nothing for us yet. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll speak up here, Travis. I am actually going to be pitching my business on stage Friday morning to a group of like probably top out around 200 people. And I've got this like 90 second pitch that I am. I You asked earlier, how much time do you take to prepare to, to pitch like this? It's hours to prepare for 90 seconds. I, I don't do that kind of preparation when I'm facilitating because I'm sort of relying on some energetics from the group and where they want to go and and things like that. Um, but for this, it's, it's probably I'm on stage three or four minutes total because they are going to ask me a couple of questions too. Um, I don't know if I'll be at a podium or just standing on the stage. I think physically is what I'm I'm thinking through here. What then maybe this goes back to things you talked about earlier, but if you're actually in a room with a crowd of people and you have to be on stage in front of them and talk about what you do physically, what uh what would you recommend? Yeah, good question. One, I find that knowing my setting helps me a lot. Will there be a podium? Uh, seeing a picture from the inside of the stage, right? If it's at a hotel mm. or some workplace, you can probably see what it looks like inside there. I find that really helpful for me. If you can even get there early and just I get, will some, be. Yeah. Get, some, get some time on the stage, mm -hmm. on the stage and just looking out and thinking about your key points as you're talking with everybody. Okay. Um, that familiarization nice. helps it's like eating a peppermint while you study for the test and then you eat a peppermint when you take the test, right? The yeah, yeah, yeah. Actual neurons in our brain connecting. So that's one thing I, I would say to definitely do in terms of moving, I, like ask questions, the stage production people, everybody who's, if you have a facilities or like a coordinator person, I would just ask them, hey, any idea to know what the stage setup will be? I wanna prepare my mm -hmm. best. And they'll appreciate you're trying to do that and give you the info. Again, the biggest thing for you, if you're full body stage, no podium and just in front of people to pitch your business. Even if you have a podium, I'm going to challenge you to leave it. Okay. It's to stay in your feet, to feel confident when you're talking, to avoid the hands together in front of you or behind right. you, but having them at your side or gathering, pointing, um, doing things like that, pacing a little bit when you're shifting thoughts, uh, or if you're, hmm. you've noticed you've been stagnant or feel like it's a little stagnant, you can move a little bit as well. Um, I, I would say those are those are the things that come to mind and definitely work out that morning beforehand. <laughs> yeah. 
I wish I could. I'm actually getting there extra early to set up an exhibit table that the pitch directs people to. So there's sort of a flow and I will get an opportunity to step on the stage in that setting up time frame. Um, but I might have to prioritize sleep over <laughs> working out. At Thank you for point, this though. This is really helpful. At a certain I, point, like that's what it becomes. I, I need the rest too. I'm not yeah. just going to early and drive myself crazy at some point. Exactly. You know you're going to say, you got it down. You've done all the work. You got to trust yourself there too. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to say, I appreciate you reinforcing that it's perfectly acceptable to have your arms at your sides and not feel like you have to do something with them. <laughs> No, not all Thank the time. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe like once every 30 seconds, find a way. I don't know, but, mm -hmm. uh, if I you're do have a one, two, three bit. I can. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I know you responded to the, um, survey about structure stuff. So if you look in the uh, cool kit, it's the, mm -hmm. that format. Why, what, how, what, if that's what I would encourage you to think through with your pitch. Are you telling them why they should care? Do you have to define anything and then tell them yeah. what you want them to do about it, how they can proceed. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. And the, the what if section is actually important. I guess since we're talking about it, I'll throw it in. The what if section is really important too and might help you feel really prepared in engagements of any type. Um, it's all about what questions might somebody have. What knowledge are you giving them? I might tell you how to make uh, a plantain recipe. And you might have questions about, well, what if I'm allergic to oil or can I cook other types of fruit this way? That type of question, if you have that at the end of your presentation, does a couple things. You're prepared for curveballs. Two, when you go, what'd y'all think? Any feedback? Thanks. It's not crickets. If you get crickets, you can offer up one or two of these questions. Well, when I thought through this, I thought some of you might be thinking, what about blah, blah, blah. And an extra thing to consider is this. And that kind of helps people shift into question mode and start asking questions with you. So since we talked about format, I'll tie off the what if section. Thanks. There's a lot of great stuff coming in in chat that I'm noticing. Uh, Casey said a couple of times, filming yourself just to see what ticks you've got. Jacob had this really cool resource about the a view from my view. Seat. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I've never seen that one before. Um, let's just open it up for any other questions, comments. Karen, I notice you're off mute. Maybe that's a dang. Oh, no, no. Um, I'm just multiple. No problem. Oh. Travis, here's your dog. Yeah, and we're getting an Amazon delivery or something. We'll see how much she uh, pipes up. What's up with that? My, my dog hates the Amazon delivery guy. This was awkward. Anybody in uniform? I don't know. <laughs> um, Travis, I, I've got a question for you. This one might be a little bit uh, different. What about dress? Um, how do you think about like what to wear? Uh, usually I try to take a cue off of my clients and I try to go... And maybe like a step above or a half step above them. But I'm wondering if there's anything that you've picked up on presentation. I mean, is there anything like absolutely not to wear? That's a really good question. This one comes back to mirroring for me too. I'll always ask, you might be able to tell context based on the event, but I'll always ask, what's the dress code at this? How do you all normally dress in the office? Uh, I, I wore a full suit for the first part of my selling career um, every day in the South Florida heat, clean shaven, tie, everything. Terrible. Yeah, I know, Jacob. Like you and me are similar, I think, with the granola e type of vibe, right? And uh, I, I now see Casey's like, well, yeah, don't you want to be taken serious? That's why I'm in my collar. Um, so uh, I, I think it's a matter of mirroring what do they expect and, it, and not being below it. You don't need to be above it, but just not being below it. So if they say business casual, don't show up casual. Um, if they're in long sleeve button downs without a jacket i think polo is fine we're moving around a lot you know it's, it's okay to be in a collared shirt that's more simple or um if you wear feminine tops go for a blouse um something like that is fine but it's to me it's always mirroring and then there's also an element of comfort mm. so i prefer to be comfortable that's why i do a lot of sports polos uh versus the full suit but if i'm at a nice dinner or if somebody if it's like i'm coaching people in finance or something like that the startup scene Sometimes I'll throw the the suit back on or like the um, IT leader classic with like jeans, the long sleeve button down and the jacket over it or something like that. So it's kind of casual, kind of can be dressed up. Um, I also used to keep at my desk an extra undershirt 
an extra button, uh, white short, uh, long sleeve button down and an extra tie. So I was always, and a Clorox pen. I was always prepared no matter what. So if uh, a lot of us are in our home office now, so all the spare clothes are right there. But if you're on site or traveling somewhere, always have an extra pair of everything. Yeah. You never know what's going to go wrong. <laughs> You know, I, it's, it's funny you mentioned that I have just started packing with me a polo shirt and a sweater in my kit, you know, in my, in, with my markers right there, because I found that it doesn't matter what the weather's doing outside at this weird change of the seasons. Like it can be really, really hot or really, really cold at the venue. And I have zero control over it. So thank you. It's for the speaking. worst. Like, I, you know, in Florida, it would be so hot outside and then it's freezing cold in the venues. Now in Seattle, I'm cold and it's rainy. I've got rain jackets and then I step in and the venue is too hot. Mm -hmm. so. yeah the weather is not an indicator of the the venue <laughs> well travis this has been awesome let's do one more go around looks like a couple of folks have got to go walk dogs and get kids to bed um questions comments anything else for travis are you complete going once twice i just scolded myself about not holding the pause <laughs> so the into the pause <laughs> All right. Well, Travis, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I really, really appreciate it. And folks, you know, I'm not just a, a, a promoter of Travis. I'm also a client. I highly recommend that you reach out to him for a little bit of presentation coaching. I, I know that I took his advice to heart um, and I feel like I feel better. You know, I feel like a better presenter and a better facilitator because of his advice. I would highly recommend it. So Travis, thanks a lot. And thank I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, you all. It's been a lot of fun.